First and foremost, I want you to know God wants you to spend eternity with him in heaven. Heaven is prepared. Uh, uh, Jesus even says it's pre he's prepared a place for you and me. Heaven is for us. The judgment seat of Christ is for the believers. We started the week before a new series called Endgame. And we're looking and we're going through the book of Revelation. Now, I told the first service for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be in school. All right? We have all kind of different series and, and, you know, we talk about relationships or we may talk about this or that. This one, we're really going to study the Bible and I want you to have an understanding of what the book of Revelation is all about. And I've heard this many times from people, oh, I don't want to read, the, I don't want to read Revelation because I, I get scared. It freaks me out. All right? Maybe, maybe that's you. Uh, I don't want you to be afraid of the book of Revelation. I want you to learn, I want you to be able to understand and embrace what God's end game plan is for the church and the redemption of the earth. So this is a series that I think at times that will rest kind of heavy on your heart. And, you know, I told the first service, we're, we're going to, it might feel a little heavy again today, but that's okay. We got hot dogs outside. All right. So, so, so don't be depressed. We want, we, I want you to really uh, find confidence and joy in learning what the Bible says. So back on April 7th, when we kicked this off, we started by talking about the rapture of the church. And we ended that service with a deep conviction of the Holy Spirit. If you missed it, you got to watch it. Uh, I want you to, to listen to that. Maybe send it to someone who needs to hear that, uh, going through this series is, I think, extra relevant, especially what's, with what's happening in the world right now. If you want to know what, what the clock is on God's clock on planet Earth, look at Israel. Pay attention to Israel. Now, I, as a church and myself, you say, where do you stand? I stand with Israel. Israel is, when you read in the Bible, we know that God chose Israel. He worked through Israel. Israel, I believe, has a right to defend themselves. Now, I may not always agree with whatever decision that's made in government or a lot of those other things, but I'm always going to stand for Israel, pray for peace uh, for Israel. But we know on October 7th of last year, they were attacked. There are still hostages that have been uh, taken uh, and then war has broken out, and there is fighting. Uh, most recently, if you're keeping up with the news, just a couple of days ago, uh, Iran attacked Israel. All right, so I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but they launched uh, thousands of missiles, and I, what someone called suicide drones, that attacked the nation of Israel. Now they were able to defend themselves, but it's a significant thing. That was a significant moment. For a number of reasons. Um, first is this, that we see that in this modern era, one of the, it's one of the first times that Iran actually attacked Israel from their own soil. So normally attacks would be carried out through Hezbollah or these other groups, but they actually launched the attack from Iran and they attacked Israel. Why did that happen? Uh, part of the reason is the United States is no longer the lone superpower in the world. We were for a while, but we're not anymore. Okay, the world, uh, uh, these other nations don't fear us like they did before. And we're in a, a, in a moment right now where they say this is maybe the 27th time in the history of the world where there's one, more than one superpower. Uh, China, is a, would be considered a superpower. Um, we know Russia is another strong nation, but China, and they're aligned with uh, these, you know, Iran and North Korea and all of these things. So uh, these, th it's the world that we're in. Part of it, if you look at our current government, uh, whether or not you voted for our president, you, what he said, what did he say? What do you want to say to Iran? Don't. That's all he said. Well, they did, and they attacked, and so there's no weight behind that. But but I want you to see this is that this may be, all right, may be prophetic again, because what, what I've, uh, in studying uh, through, through my years of studying Revelation, one of the things that's always been brought up is that you don't hear any reference or even any resemblance of any nation of the United States being mentioned in the end times. 
You don't hear about the United States. So is it in prophetic, again, that the United States drops back? I don't know, but it may be. Uh, they do say there's mention of what they think China, because there's mention of an, the army from the east that's going to march to Israel for the final battle, a million-man army, which they know that China can actually support that million-man army. So this may, again, be all prophetic in what's happening. But either way, uh, one of the things that we know in the book of Revelation that's going to happen is what is World War III. World War III. Look at the headlines right now. What do, you, what do you see? I've seen many times World War III. In fact, I looked up the doomsday clock. I think this is the shortest that it's ever been. It's at 90 seconds. In 90 seconds. So that measures how close we are to nuclear war. Right now it's 90 seconds. And it's been at 90 seconds for a while. I think the longest was 12 minutes. But right now, 90 seconds, we're, we're close and it's imminent. But prophetically, when you read, there's going to be a road war that's going to happen again. And that's going to happen. So I just say all of this, not again to get you afraid. If you're afraid, then you need to get Jesus in your life. All right. We talked about the rapture. He's coming back for the church. I don't want anyone to miss the rapture. Uh, get right with God. And so if you feel uncomfortable, uh, just let that motivate you to get in your life right with God. And if you feel fearful for people in your life, they say, I don't know if they know Jesus, reach out to them. Uh, truth is not to condemn. Truth is really to set you free. My job is to present the truth. Then you decide what you do with it. So um, this morning, what I want to talk to you about, you say, this, well, you probably weren't expecting this, but we're going to talk a little bit about heaven this morning. Is that okay? We're going to talk about heaven. And then next week, you don't want to miss next week. Next week, we're going to take it up a notch because we're going to be talking about the seven seals that are going to be unleashed and God's redemp really God's redemption plan for earth. So that it's going to get a little crazy next week when you start here. So if there's anybody you know that you want to scare the hell out of, bring them to church next week. <laughs> All right? There's some people you got to scare the hell out of them. I told, I, I just, I was telling them, I have a friend who uh, been serving the Lord. It's been like 20, 20, no, maybe 25 years now, still serving God because of a message she watched. Didn't grow up in church. I gave, him, I gave her a videotape that preached about the rapture. She watched that, and it literally scared the hell out of her. She goes, I am not missing it. I am getting right with God, and she's still serving the Lord today. So um, there's some people, they can just walk in, oh, I want to serve the Lord, but there's a, they're kind of hard. You got... Bring them next week, all right? We're going to talk about the seven seals. But I'm going to do my best to teach this. I decided today, how do I teach this, right? So we're going to school. I'm just going to assume that everyone here has never heard anything from this, and I'm just going to break it down as basic as I can. So you might be like, oh, I heard this before. Well, hear it again, because there's others who need to hear this. But in Revelation chapter 4, as John starts, he starts with heaven. First and foremost, I want you to know God wants you to spend eternity with him in heaven. Heaven is prepared. Uh, uh, Jesus even says it's pre he's prepared a place for you and me. Heaven is for us. Every other vision that we get of heaven is taken from the perspective of someone on earth looking into heaven. What's different about John's revelation is that he's transported by the Spirit into heaven and he's getting to watch firsthand in that environment how God is orchestrating this moment. So in Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, John said, Then as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven. And the same voice I had heard before me spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up here and I will show you what must happen after this. And instantly I was in the spirit and I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. Again, as we talk about the rapture, many times uh, people will reference this as to... John living through and experiencing this, he is raptured. We know that Jesus said at the end, there's going to be the sound of the church age, a trumpet. We're going to hear the trumpet, and then we're going to be caught up with Christ. As John talks about this, he heard a voice like a trumpet, and instantly he is raptured in the spirit. John received this revelation. He was a prisoner on the island of Patmos. It's a Greek island in the Aegean Sea. He's exiled here, 
And God begins to reveal this to him. And so in this portion of scripture, he begins to describe what he sees in heaven. And in verse 2, he said, I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. As he begins to describe God, he doesn't use human attributes. He doesn't want to bring God down to our level. He's trying his best to explain what God, uh, what he sees God looking at. He said, the one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones, like jasper and carnelian. And the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. And so as he describes who God is, the best that he can do is to say it's, it's like the brilliance of gemstones, light that's just illuminating, and it's just brilliant. And I want you to know when we talk about the glory of God, if you took today the most eloquent words crafted, crafted by the greatest wordsmith, their words would still be like gravel compared to how great God is. His glory and His majesty could never be expressed in our limited human knowledge. And John is doing his best to describe the glory of God, but still, it's not enough. And all I can say to you is this. I, I don't want to hear about a description of God. I want to see it. I can't wait to see it. And I hope every single one of us one day get to see and experience the great glory and the great majesty of who God is. You realize that God is sovereign. He is all-powerful. He is almighty. And he has a plan today of how all of this is going to play out. I know sometimes people get all freaked out. Oh, they're taking God out of government. They're taking God out of... And I want to tell you this. God isn't insecure. He's not insecure. He's on the throne and everything's playing out exactly as he plans for it to play out. He is glorious. Psalms 104.2 speaks of God as one whose garment is light. Paul describes him in 1 Timothy as one whose unapproachable light. Ezekiel says the throne appears like sapphire surrounded by rainbow. And they're talking really about a symbolic form of the majesty of God. He's resplendent and clothed in his glory. And all I can say is as best as we can say is like the team sang today, how great is our God? How great is our God? And I want you to know that he is great. He is majestic and he is powerful. And so he looks at his throne and again, I, you know, I just think John thought, well, I can't say anything else. That's all I can say, light, glory. I can't describe it any other way. And so as he looks at the throne in verse 4, he says, there were 24 thrones that surrounded him and 24 elders sat on them. And they were all clothed in white and had crowns of gold upon their head. So there's the throne of God. And then surrounding the throne of God were 24 thrones with 24 elders dressed in white and with crowns of gold. Who are these 24 elders? I'll tell you this. They're not angels. Nowhere in the Bible do we read of angels who had crowns. We don't read of angels who had thrones. And so who do these 24 elders represent? Now in the Bible, what you find is that when you see different numbers, they represent different things. Now 24 is mentioned in the Bible six different times. And every time it's mentioned, it refers to the Levites or the priesthood. In Israel, there were 12 tribes of Israel. The Levites were a tribe of Israel, and these were the priests. These were the people that were assigned to minister to God and to take care of the temple of the Lord. So what people may not realize is that the Levites numbered in the thousands. There were thousands of Levites, thousands of people who were to serve in the temple. So if there's only one temple, how many of you know they can't all serve at the same time? There wouldn't be enough things to do. It'd be too crowded. So what happens, what we see is that in 1 Chronicles 24, David divides the Levites into 24 different groups. 
24 different groups that serve, uh, I think it was twice a week in the year, these 24 groups would serve in the temple, and each group would be represented by an elder. And so when they would have a meeting with the Levites, these 24 elders would gather, and these 24 elders represented the entire priesthood. These uh, 24 that also would gather there, these were 24 that Bible tells us they were clothed in white. Every time you see people clothed in white in the book of Revelation, it refers to the saints. It refers to the saints that they were clothed in white and again in the crowns. So I want you to, and we're going to look at the crowns, but in 1 Peter 2.9, what did Peter say? See, a lot of times we think, well, I'm just a Christian. I gave my life to the Lord. But you know what Peter says? That you are a chosen people. And listen to this. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. Do you know that when you come into the kingdom of God, that you become a priest? What were the priest's jobs? Minister to God. So who is our great high priest? Not a trick question. Our great high priest... All right, I know we're like in school, and just like in school, you don't want to answer, but it's okay. <laughs> Jesus, he's our great high priest. Just as in the Bible, there would be one great high priest, and then there were the priests after. We are a royal priesthood, but we have a great high priest who is Jesus, and we together as the body of Christ, we minister unto God. All right? And so when you look in here, Revelations 3, 5 tells us uh, those who overcome are clothed in white. And then the Bible also talks about this. There are five crowns that we can receive. All right? You see this in the New Testament. We're not going to we don't have time to get into this whole teaching, but there are five crowns. There's the imperishable crown, rejoice, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of righteousness, the crown of glory, the crown of life. These are for the saints, five crowns that we can be rewarded with. Now, we've taught on this. I've taught on this a number of times, uh, the, the reward that we have. So remember, we are saved by grace. Give me a good amen on that. Amen. We're saved by grace. We're saved because of Jesus. He died on the cross. He made us right with God. We can go to heaven because of Jesus. But what happens is quite often people will say, well, I'm saved by grace. There's nothing else I need to do. Well, when it comes to your salvation, that's true. But when you get saved by grace, there is something else for you to do. You say, what is that? You need to do good things. Now, you don't do good things to get to heaven. You do good things because you're already going to heaven. Did you guys catch that? All right, I don't want anyone leaving saying, oh, that Evan said that you got to do good things. To go. No, 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 no. No, I don't do good things to go to heaven. I do good things because I am already going to heaven. And what the Bible talks about is the judgment seat of Christ. So there's the great white throne judgment. We're going to talk about that at the end of Revelation. But there is also what's called the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is for the believers. If you believe in Jesus today, the judgment seat of Christ is for you. We're going to go before Jesus, and it's at the judgment seat of Christ. I'll just summarize. I don't know what words exactly, but this is basically what it is. We'll stand before Jesus, and he's going to ask this question, what did you do with the gifts that I gave you? What did you do? Did you use your talents? Were you faithful and what I gave you on earth, did you use it to reach others? And what we find out is that at the judgment seat of Christ, there are going to be rewards that are going to be handed out. There are going to be crowns that are going to be handed out. And so what you do today, how you steward your life on earth will determine whether or not you receive a reward. Are you, are you guys still tracking with me? And so we, we receive that. And you may wonder today, um, you know, when, when do we get that reward? Well, Revelation twenty two twelve, 12, Jesus said, look, I'm coming soon and I'm bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. When the church is raptured, you receive your reward. 
And so learning that today, uh, you look at the 24 elders, what does that represent? The 24 elders around the throne represents the church. It represents the saints. It represents everyone that is overcome from the old and the new. It represent, it's a representation today of you and me. Those 24 represent the entire priesthood. Okay? So we, we got that. Now, as we continue on, from the throne came flashes of lightning and thunder. Uh, in front of the throne, he says there are seven torches with flames represent the seven spirits of God, who many think represent the seven angels of the seven churches that's represented in Revelation chapter 1 and 2. And we didn't talk about that yet. But how many of you know, like, you guys watch some of those Marvel movies? There's always a prequel. So in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a prequel, and we're going to talk about the seven churches and the seven angels and, and, and where we are in that timetable. But we see those things. In front of the throne, John describes a sea of glass like crystal free of impurities. Uh, what that is, uh, maybe it is just a sea. We know that the psalmist says, you lay your beams on the chambers on the waters. But that beautiful sea surrounds the throne. And around the throne now, John describes the four living beings. Okay, so if you're reading the Bible before... And you're like, oh, this is good. I get this. Heaven, da, da, da. And you get to this part. This is probably where some of you might have said, whoa. This is where it gets kind of weird. This is where it gets a little different. So I don't, I don't want to lose you. Look at your neighbor and say, stay with me. <laughs> All right? This is where John begins to describe the four living beings. So there is the throne, the throne of God. On the outside, it's surrounded by 24 thrones, 24 elders. And then what John says is around the throne, the inner circle of that. In John, uh, Revelation 4, 6, in the center around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes, front and back. The first of these living beings was like a lion, the second like an ox, the third had a human face, and the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of these living beings had six wings, and their wings were covered all over with eyes. So use your thinking caps. Imagine that. These wings covered with eyes inside and out, day after day and night after night, they keep on saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. These were an exalted order of angelic beings, immediate guardians around the throne, who lead the heavenly host in worship and adoration to God day and night, night and day, holy, holy, holy. I think that's one of the most powerful phrases that we can ever utter. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Whenever you do, just know that you are joining with the angelic beings in heaven. Holy, holy, holy to the Lord is the Lord. Praise of his holiness. His affirmation of his omnipotence that stretches from eternity to eternity to the one who is the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, who was, who is, and who is to come. We hear of similar creatures, the cherubim, the seraphim, and Ezekiel and Isaiah, but, but these are different. They're not the same. And you know, one of the things to point out again in a lot of things that John describes, he uses the word like, 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 because again, his words can't fully capture in his human understanding. So he's, it's, it's like, the, it's, it's just kind of like this. It's like trying to describe, ever try to describe something that no one's ever tried before? It's, it's, it's just like this. What do frog legs taste like? Well, it's kind of like chicken. It's kind of like fish. It's, it's, I, I can't really describe, you just got to try it, right? So he's, it's, it's like this. And he talks about these four living beings that circle the throne. A face like a lion, a face like an ox. There's another one, a face like a human. And the last one, a face like an eagle. What is the significance of them? Well, what is the lion? The lion, uh, one term is the king of the jungle, right? The lion. The, the king of all beasts. Uh, the lion, uh, you could just say, he's the ruler of the wild animals. The strongest in the in jungle, the lion. 
What is the ox? The ox would be the strongest of the domesticated animals. It would be the ox. They, you could domesticate them, put them to work. The ox was the strongest. The human would be probably, you could say, the strongest, the, the king of the earth. It's actually the humans. And humans are at the top of the food chain. Uh, the, the humans rule on earth. And then the eagle, you could say, is the king of the sky. Probably the, the greatest animal in the sky would be the eagle. And when you look at this, and, and another, another interpretation someone had was just to say that the lion represents the wild places of the earth, the ox, the domesticated places or farm places, the man representing the city and the towns, and the eagle, the expanse of the sky. But either way, these four creatures, what it best comes to our understanding is they re represent God's entire creation here on planet earth, covers the earth, whether it's in the wild, the domesticated, the city, the towns, those four creatures cover those four, uh, the four corners of the world. God's created earth. And these fly around. They not only are protecting and the inner circle around the throne, but we find is they actually have a power in the sense of carrying out God's judgment, orchestrating his wrath on earth. Next week, when we talk about the seven seals, you look at the first four seals that have to do with earth, right? The, the Antichrist that's going to come out on the white horse. Why the white horse? White represents peace. The, uh, I, I'm going to waste. Okay, we'll talk about that next year. The Antichrist, we know there's going to be uh, the death that's going to come out. That's World War III famine. All those seals that when they're, you read this, and I encourage you, Again, we're, in, like we, we're going to be in school. Can I encourage you to read the book of Revelation? Go home and read it. Read it. Study it. But what you find, you, you'll see this in uh, Revelation uh, chapter 5 when, when the seals are 6. When the seals are broken, nothing happens until one of those living, living uh, beings says, All right, go. The, the seal of the Antichrist, it's broken. The living beings give authority for the Antichrist to be released. And so we see that they're orchestrating uh, God's wrath. They're working on God's behalf. All right, so that's the beans around the throne, and they orchestrate heavenly worship. Now we're going to land this plane. Stick with me here in Revelations 4.9. Look at this. Whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. Remember, John's watching this. He says, the 24 elders... They fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. The word worship originally involved the idea of prostrating oneself before it, it could have been a deity, it could have been an idol, or whatever it was. And, and these people in the Middle East especially, they would prostrate, kiss the feet, an act of reverence, and to get down. The word, the root word, worth-ship. When we worship, we, we ascribe worth to something. And that's why I say all the time, worship's the most important thing because we were created to worship the Lord. And, you know, there are some people who struggle with the idea of, of why, why do this? Why, why do that? Why, why do I have to do good things? Is it, you know, you might be hearing me, and you, you literally might have thought this, Evan, I don't care if I have a, throne, a crown in heaven. Why do I want a crown in heaven? Is it so I can show off? Is it so I can flex? I got more than you. I did more than you. Like, why? Why would those things matter we sing it in songs all the time we we hear the phrase but what we see illustrated by the 24 around the throne that represents the church and you and me is that they take their crown and every time those living beings start worship in heaven they take the crown and they cast it at the throne because what they're saying is they're, they're realizing that the authority that had been given to them is a delegated authority. They cast their crowns at the throne 
And they began to worship. Holy is the Lord. Worthy is the Lamb. And what, what, what I hope we could grasp today, when, when, I, when I encourage people, use your gift, do something, do something. We talk about the judgment seat of Christ. Why? Because one day we're going to stand before Jesus and he's going to ask us what we did. And we're going to receive crowns. We're going to receive a reward. But again, it's not so that we can walk around and, and show it off. We're going to receive that reward. And when we get to heaven, we're going to have that opportunity. When the living beings cry out and the 24 elders and, and all the church that's there represented. And we take our crown. We're going to take our rewards. We're going to take our, our trophies if I will, if you will, from this life. And we're going to take those things, not so that we can show off, but we're going to take these and we're going to take them and we're going to cast them at the feet, the feet of Jesus. And we're going to say, Lord, the only reason I have these is because of you. The only reason that I've been forgiven is because of you. The only reason that I could sing or, or play an instrument or serve in kids ministry or, or love on people at the door was because of you. And so I take all that I have and I throw it at your feet because God, I wouldn't have it if it was because of you. And it's at the feet thrown that we then begin to worship. And we give him the glory. And we realize that Whatever authority or throne that we have is only because of God. In fact, right now, just, just thank the Lord. Just take a few moments. Worship Him. His glory, His goodness. God, it's all because of You. It's been 20 years, but God, we're not celebrating because of it. God, it's because of you. We lay it at your feet. Our abilities, our gifts, and our talents, we lay at your feet. The best part of us, God, we lay at your feet. We're surrendered. We're surrendered. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. For from you are all things. And to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Sing it to heaven this morning. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. For from you are all things. And to you are all things. You deserve the glory. All the saints. All the saints and angels bow before your throne. Your throne. Lift your voice, sing. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Oh, oh, oh. 
this morning, maybe as you, you heard this message, it maybe made you afraid. Maybe, maybe you think, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready. Again, I'm not sharing this to get people afraid. I'm, I'm sharing this so you can know truth and you can have a confidence walking out, out of here today that there's a God who loves you, a Jesus who gave his life for you, and that you can know his mercy today. I said it earlier, we don't go to heaven because we do good things. It's only through Jesus. And so today, before we end, I want to give you the opportunity to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you're watching with us online today. The opportunity to confess Him as Lord and Savior of your life, to know heaven as your home, to know His grace, to know His love. Can we all say this together? Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to the cross. I believe Jesus died for me. I also believe that He rose from the dead. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. And I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name.